There are quite a few more than the last time I looked back. When I first looked back, when I first got here with Nathan, it was just my parents, <laughs> which is lovely, which is lovely. But uh, <laughs> let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, I just pray that um, you would work this afternoon, Father, through these expository sermons, Father. Lord, I pray that you would take away anything in my life, in my heart, that's keeping me from a pure connection to you during this time. Lord, I pray that for all of us. I know that we're heading into midterms week. I know that there's a lot bearing down on our minds, perhaps, Father, but give us this time. Allow this time to be yours, Father. Allow us to be taught. Lord, I ask that you would just hide me. Hide me so well, Father, please. Lord, may I not misrepresent you as my prayer during this time. Amen. So my family loves um, to travel. We love to travel. And by the age of, I think, probably two or three, I'd already been um, on a couple airplane flights. And at this time, Mayan wasn't around. And it was just my parents and myself. It was the three of us, which was perfect. Because in the plane, no, 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 it's not Mayan. Oh, she's listening. This is not going well. No, it's not, it's not that. It's, it's the fact that when we're sitting in airplane row, there's three seats, right? So we would all be together all the time. There wouldn't have to be one of us out. And so I remember, regardless of where we were going, it was either I was in the middle or I was on the side, and I had both my parents with me all the time. And that's the only type of airplane ride I had experienced. And then around the age of two to three, um, I don't know where we were traveling. I think we were going from Michigan to San Diego to visit family. And for the first time, my father was not going to be traveling with us. This was a very big deal for me, and so I got in there, and my mother could tell I was already a little bit worried because there was that seat there, and you know, the people are coming in, the bees and the seas, and, and you're getting worried, and, and then lo and behold, a gentleman decided to take that seat. And my mother tells me that I was sitting there, and I was sitting, I was sitting on the, the edge there uh, with the window seat. She was in the middle seat, and I began to look over, look over my mother and look at this guy who was sitting where my father was supposed to be sitting. <laughs> And I looked over once, I looked over twice, and I kept looking over, and my mother was getting worried, just pushing me back. I was pushing against that silly little belt, trying to see who this guy was. And then finally, I told my mom, while leaning over, looking at the man, I said, Mom, does that man love you? <laughs> I, I feel really bad for whoever that guy was. He probably was like, what in the world is this kid thinking? But you have to imagine my two-year-old mind at the time. You have to imagine what I'm going through. I'm, I'm collecting all the data, and I'm thinking, every time I'm sitting here, that guy's my dad, and I know my dad loves my mom. And so if that guy's going to take his seat, surely, surely he must be interested in my mother. <laughs> and this was not going well for two-year-old Mark Keon. I know this is kind of a humorous story, but on a sobering note, I hate to say that 19 years later, I still trust my judgment explicitly. I still look at all the data I can, and I make up these statements. Now, no, I'm not, I'm not so blatant anymore. I don't go onto planes and say, hey, you like that person, can you say the neck? No, I don't do that anymore. Don't worry, you all can fly with me. Um, that's not the problem. But there are things that we do trust our judgment to quite a bit, isn't there? And we don't say them out loud. We keep them in our minds. We share them with our friends. And these these assumptions about people, about things, begin to circulate, and they typically cause a lot of problems. It's fascinating. Our text, our passage of study is James 4, 11, actually 11 to 12. And what I'm going to want to work through with you is this idea of judgment. James, the brother of Christ, talks about judgment, the kind we're not called to do. And so I want to state first, in my first point, that judgment is in fact, in its rawest sense, taking the place of God. Secondly, let's make that relevant. Are we spiritual vigilantes? Do we like to take the law into our own hands? And finally, the only answer to this, and this is the part that I'm most excited about, is that we have a judge that can save. Okay, that's coming at the end, so hang on with me, okay? Go ahead and open your Bibles, if you haven't already, to James 4, verse 11. And we're going to kind of unpack that verse and try to understand what kind of judgment James is talking about. Because how many of you have heard the phrase before, don't judge me? Oh, a lot, right? 
Okay, well, I've asked a lot of guys, a couple of guys at the academy up here, what do you guys think? What does judgment mean? What's the difference between rebuking, judging, observing? There has to be, you know, we are called to judge in some sense. We're all even called to judge ourselves. But what's the judgment that we're not supposed to do? So let's look at James 4.11 here. It says, speak evil, speak not evil, one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaketh evil of the law and judges the law. Let's just wait right there. So we see that speaking evil of your brother is equivalent chronologically in the verse to speaking evil of the law and judging is equal to judging the law. That's kind of a weird phrase, isn't it? Judging the law. I mean, I don't know how many times you've been in a court and there's a law sitting in front to be judged. That doesn't happen very often. But if you look at the word judge there, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this correctly, but I believe it is krino in the Greek, and it means to properly distinguish, to decide. Therefore, you could almost say that, you could say that judging your brother is equal to deciding when the law works. Deciding when the law applies based on you, based on your own observations. Judging someone in the context of this verse, verse I believe, and in the context of it being negative, is when you put yourself above the law and based on your observations of someone, you decide whether that law applies to them or not, which is in a sense sentencing them. You become judge, witness, jury, and executioner. And this is taking the place of God. But let's look at it from a different angle. Let's look at it from more of a symbolic angle. Okay, there's quite a few verses, I'm sure you've heard them before, where it talks about the judgment seat of God or the throne of judgment. Psalms 9, 7 to 8 says, But the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment. So we see that there's a connection now between thrones, God's throne, and judgment. Fascinating, because we have in the sanctuary... A, a type of God's throne, the one with the cherubims on it, something called the mercy seat. You've all heard of the mercy seat, I'm sure. Tell me something based on this, judging the law. Is there something in the mercy seat that would cause you to wonder? What, what's something in the mercy seat that has to do with law? The Ten Commandments are in the law. So then you could almost hypothetically say that sitting on the law, sitting on the throne sitting on the mercy seat, God's throne, the foundation of that is the law. The law is in his throne. This is fascinating. Bear with me. In the NIV version of James 4.11, it reads this way. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. Now, where would one have to be if he's sitting, and he's also sitting on top of the law, in judgment, he would have to be sitting on God's throne. The NIV puts it perfectly, and, and the point that I'm trying to say is, yes, you take God's authority, but ultimately, in a symbolic sense of the NIV, it's saying that you are also attempting to take God's throne. There's someone a long time ago who attempted to do this. It was Lucifer. You've all heard the verse before, Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. But you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly. Zyra of Ages, chapter 30, puts it this way. Judge not that ye be not judged. Do not think yourself better than other men and set yourself up as their judge, since you cannot discern motive. You are incapable of judging another. In criticizing him, you are passing sentence upon yourself, for you show that you are a participant, a participant with Satan, the accuser of the brethren. Fascinating. Fascinating. Now I'm curious. Let's move to point two. That's all good and well. Okay, taking Lucifer was trying to take God's throne. Okay, judgment is, is taking away the authority of God. But we're all Christians here, right? We're all good Seventh-day Adventists, as my brother pointed out. Maybe, maybe, let me put it this way, maybe you don't want to dethrone God. 
Maybe you're, not, maybe you're not trying to take God completely out of the picture. Maybe you just want your throne above his throne. Your judgment, your seat of judgment above his. What do you call someone then who decides to take the law into their own hands? I mentioned it earlier as my second point. You would ta- term someone that. You would call someone who did that a vigilante. Turn with me to Jonah, chapter 4, verses 1, 2, and 11. You all know this story, but if you'd like to be there as I go through it, I'm going to spend some time there trying to unpack this idea of Christian vigilantism, of how we pass judgment on others. In Jonah 4, 1, it simply states that when Jonah found out what was going to happen to Nineveh, that they were not, in fact, going to be destroyed. It says that it displeased Jonah exceedingly and left him very angry. I want you to kind of take a moment in this. Jonah's an evangelist, right? And I want you to think, this is, as far as I know, I don't know how many times this is, but this is an evangelist with no intention of saving anybody. I don't know how many times you can, you can preach, how hard that would be to preach a sermon and just be like, yeah, you're all not going to make it anyway. <laughs> I mean, how many sermons could you get through thinking and knowing that this is pretty much just a pre-hell course for all of you? I'm just giving you the choice. I'm letting you be aware because I know you're all not going to do well, and then I'm going to leave you, and I'm going to sit at the top, and I'm going to watch it happen. An evangelist, a Christian, a missionary with no intent to save. Now, praise God, God's not that way, right? His intent is always to save. Jonah, Jonah's goal was indeed not the soul. His goal wasn't the soul. And so I want, I want you to think of this. Let me, let me put it this way. Have you ever in your life become frustrated when something good happens to somebody? Someone you think that doesn't deserve that. Or, or maybe it's this. Maybe it's a TCI contact and you're working with them and, and, and they're just talking your ear off. Or, or they just you know that they're not actually interested. And in your mind you kind of check off and you're like, well, I guess we just kind of have to do this. Sometimes we do those things for the wrong reasons. Jonah continues in verse 2. And he tells God, I had a feeling, essentially what he says, I had a feeling that you were going to do this even when I was in my own country. It's fascinating. He wanted to go with God. He wanted to be, okay, let's do this, you and me, on the same page. I know what we're going to do. But in the back of his head, he said, I had a feeling that you were going to do this. I had a feeling that your intent was to save. It's a temptation for us to be frustrated at the success of others because in our minds we have already passed sentence on them. And so if they don't get what we think they ought to get, sure we may not have voiced it before, but that's a sign that you've passed judgment on them, is it not? It must mean that sometime, at some place, you observed the situation, you collected the data, and you decided That the law is to apply this way, and the effect should be felt this way. I remember a story when I was canvassing. Canvassers, you know this type of situation when you come to the door and you're sharing, and the woman of the house is very excited. And she's like, yes, yes, this is great. And all of a sudden, you hear this low voice somewhere in the back. And all of a sudden, she says, excuse me a moment, and you know that that's it. And she goes to the back, and there's a conversation that happens. And they come back to the door, and miraculously, she's no longer interested whatsoever. And you say, okay, what about, what about this? What about this? What about this? Maybe this cookbook. Maybe this. And she kind of looks up at the corner of her eye to the top of the stairs to a dark figure up there. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. This happened to me. And I left, and I was walking down the block, and I was like, you know what? So much for that husband. 
I'm ashamed to say it, but I know. I was very disappointed. And I was very frustrated at this gentleman for doing this to his wife, who seemed to be interested. And I was rebuked. Not a couple of blocks down, I saw this gentleman run out of his house barefoot. And he ran to me and he said, I'm so, 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 so sorry. I really need to see some of these books. Because God's intention is always to save. But to bring it back one more time to the vigilante idea, have you ever considered what the cost of passing judgment on people would be if you actually could judge? For Jonah, it was the deaths of six score thousand persons, it says in verse 11. How often we just kind of check that off and decide, oh yeah, that's where that person should go and that person's not going to make him this, that, and the other. That is, in fact, when you say that that is about a person, that is where you intend for them to go. Right? Earlier today, if you were here, my brother Chen talked about judgment also. And one of his applications was the faith of Jesus, the faith we saw in Gethsemane. And I'd like to present to you, we have Jonah, and then there's another gentleman. A man who also can't see beyond what he can see. Who pleads with the Father. Can I take this? Can you take this away? Is it worth not being me able to be with you? Do we have to be separated for this? A man who had the opportunity frankly, to also be a spiritual vigilante, to decide that it wasn't worth it. But there's that phrase, not my will, not my will, but thine. He submitted to the Father's plan and became the perpetuation for all humanity. And bringing us to the cross is where I want to begin my last point. James 4, 12, to set the stage for this, says, But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge, not a doer. Romans 2 says that, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Let me say this one more time. When we put ourselves above the law, when we decide to judicially use the law on people, how can you, how can you receive pardon from a law that you don't even believe? From a law that you're not even under? How can you be justified from a justice system that you believe you control? Let's go back to that mercy seat analogy here as we close with this idea. Stay, stay in chapter 4. Keep your finger in chapter 4. Uh, but turn to Hebrews 10. And just for some background, we know that in the sanctuary that they used, the Israelites used, they would sprinkle the mercy seat with the blood of the bull. And in Hebrews 10, it says, For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the corners thereunto perfect, the comers thereunto perfect. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. But here's the part that's beautiful. Hebrews 9, 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. By his own blood, ladies and gentlemen. I believe that the cure for judgment, the cure for, for us putting ourselves over other individuals and making our light, making others responsible for the light that we have received, is to trust the only judge that can actually save. To look to the judge that can save. We can trust him who by his own judge, by his own blood, became the judge that can save. Christ now intercedes at that mercy seat. His, his seat may have the law. It is the law, but his seat is of mercy. His throne is of mercy. The seat is of judgment. It is founded in the law, but it is covered in his blood. If we look at the verse, it says, to save and destroy. There's one lawgiver 
You can save and destroy. I don't know if you thought of this, but save and destroy, that doesn't really put us in the best spot, does it? If you need to either be saved or you either need to be destroyed, you need help. You're not coming to the judge for him to tell you not guilty or guilty. You're guilty either way, but my judge can save. And I can't, I can't believe this verse, Isaiah 33, 22, puts it perfectly. It says, for the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. There's an illustration I'd like to use as we close out. I was in Israel, and we were running from place to place, and there was one time where we went to the garden tomb. And we were at the garden tomb, and we had just finished our, our main garden experience walking around. And, and I came to this little banister out looking this parking lot. And the tour guide, a, a nice Irish priest, came up beside me. And he said, you know, that's where they think he, he potentially was either sacrificed or it is potentially another tomb area. Fascinating. He said, but you know what's even more fascinating? There's a small group of us there. He said, if you look up just a little bit higher on the bluff... There's a jihadist burial site up there. And then he kind of just left. And then the group of us were there thinking. And we were thinking. And we were thinking. And we were like, wow. It's just, just a little parking lot. There's a potential that the Son of God died there or was buried there. And if you look just a few yards up on the bluff... These are the gravestones of individuals who have died trying to get into heaven. Those jihadists had immense dedication to what they believed was right. However, they took the law into their own hands and placed themselves above it, literally becoming spiritual vigilantes. But what's fascinating and what worries me a little bit is that when we do that, we might not only find ourselves above the law, but we might also find ourselves above the mercy seat. Not only above judgment, not only above God's throne, not only taking His throne, but above His blood that's on that throne. For how can you be saved from a law that you do not even believe in? May we not join those men above the tomb. May we not seek to trust our judgment above Christ's. Because, friends, we will find that our lives will not only be lived above the throne of judgment, above, but above the seat of mercy as well. James asks a fascinating question in the end. He simply says, after talking about God who can save and destroy, he asks, but who are you? Who are you to judge another? However, the original manuscript reads it, but who are you to judge another? And that's because I think that the answer to this question is self-examination and realizing how much the Son of God did so that He could do judgment for you, so that He could be the judge that can save. How dare we take that from Him? Why would we take that from Him? For we are also condemned of this law. But, again, He is the judge that can save. We've talked about uh, based on our own observations. We've talked about being Christian vigilantes. And then finally we've talked about a judge that can save. And so my plea would be to you, to myself, would be to consider what that man went through so that he could cover your sins. So that he could now intercede which he is doing. I pray that myself and you at the very end would not find ourselves above any law. Would not find ourselves above any mercy. But that we would choose the judge that can save. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that you would continue to continue to work this afternoon, Father. I pray again, Father, that I've, if I have misrepresented you in any way, that you would forgive me of that, Father. 
Lord, these, may these thoughts that I have shared, Lord, I pray that they would be from you and that they would set in each one of our hearts a desire to know you, the judge that can save just that much more. Teach us how to do that, Father. Teach us to look to the cross. This is my prayer.